Hello everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. Welcome back. I hope that you've had a good reading month. And if you are new, thanks for checking out my channel. Please hit subscribe and stick around. Today I am doing my monthly wrap up for January. I can't believe we're already in February. Um, I had an amazing reading month in January. I participated in the Past and Future Readathon that was hosted by Emily at Novel Reads, uh, who is the original host of that. And then she was joined by Alice from Alice in the Giant Bookshelf, Jack from Spread Book Joy, and Gemma from Gem of Books. So I did six out of the eight prompts. So, you know, that wasn't too bad. Um, and I will leave links to all of their channels below so you can check those out. Um, and then I also read two books for the Reading Across Canada Challenge. And um, AJ from AJ Dunn Reads and Writes and I kicked off our Tuesdays with Tony reading project. So that's a lot of fun. Um, plus I had so many five star reads. I think it was something like seven five star reads and I read 14 books in January. So half of them were five stars. Okay, let's take a look at these books. Um, I love when the first book you read in a new year is a five star um, feel good kind of read. And the first book I finished in 2023 starts like this. The Viking my brother got me for my birthday was tall and had muscles. And this is from the debut novel When We Were Vikings by Canadian author Andrew David MacDonald. Um, this was a perfect starter for the year. The main character is Zelda. She's 21 years old and has fetal alcohol syndrome. She likes rules and schedules and she learns a word a day and she loves anything that has to do with Vikings. So as you might be able to tell, I adored Zelda. She lives with her brother, Gert, who um, makes some choices that aren't the best, uh, even though they are made with probably the best of intentions, uh, I think, anyway. Um, Zelda faces life as a Viking, as a warrior, especially once she finds out that women can be warriors and powerful too and that women can be heroes and become legendary. So Zelda decides that she will be legendary and fight the villains in the world. So this makes for a very interesting read. Um, Zelda wants to be independent. She wants to love and be loved, um, and she wants to have sex with her boyfriend, Marksy. Um, and when Zelda finds herself um, and those that she loves in danger, she faces it with courage and has a lot to teach all of the people around her, like her brother Gert. So this is just a funny and heartwarming and also sad um, novel that kicked off my reading for 2023 in a really good way. And I hope this author writes more because I would definitely be up to reading more of his work. Um, this fit the perf the this fit the prompt for past and future readathon. Uh, read a feel good book to set the tone for the new year. So it fit that perfectly. Um, this would be good for anyone who likes quirky characters, uh, like I do, and definitely if you like Vikings, um, and if you are just looking for you know something fun but also tugs at the heartstrings a little bit too. The next book that I read begins. No one knew that Hasley was emptying her house one room at a time. This is from The Company We Keep by Francis Itani. Um, I used this for the past and future readathon prompt, read a book with um, a protagonist older than you. So this was my first book by Francis Itani, and I have more of her books on my shelf, so I will eventually get to those. Um, the writing is quite lovely, and it's a very character-driven novel. Hasley is the protagonist, um, and she posts an ad about a grief discussion group. And five, maybe six people um, show up to this gathering, and they are all mourning the loss of a loved one. Uh, a spouse, a parent, a friend, um, and they are all different ages and different backgrounds. And the book begins in September and goes until December. 
So as the group members, you know, get to know each other, um, they form relationships and become friends and support for each other. So I think probably what I enjoyed most about this book is that it really handled the topic of grief so well. Um, each person dealt with their grief in their own way, um, including becoming friends with a parrot. Um, they had to look at how the grief was affecting them and how it changed the relationships that they had with their loved ones. So, um, for example, Chio was dealing with intergenerational trauma uh, from her mother because her mother was in the Japanese camps in the early 40s. And they deal with all the feelings and stages of grief, uh, the guilt, the anger, the often strange and irrational thoughts that are, you know, totally normal um, that uh, grieving people often have. And I just thought that part was very well done. So if you've ever grieved for someone close to you, uh, I think that you will be able to really relate to something in this story. Um, and then I also liked the bonds that they created with one another. Um, so this is good for anyone who enjoys uh, character-driven novels, for sure. Um, doesn't mind maybe a slower-paced book, and if you are interested in the theme of grieving in stories. Next up is a book that I've already talked about a number of times this year. It begins, They Come for the Trees. And this is from Greenwood by Michael Christie. This is a fantastic book and it was my second five star read of the year. Um, this was my pick for the Reading Across Canada challenge, uh, one of my picks, the main pick. Um, it fit the prompt for BC and it's a book about nature. So this has also just recently been shortlisted for the Canada Reads Debates. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, you know, seeing how far it goes because I think it definitely has uh, potential to be in the top two and maybe even win. So we will see if I change my mind after I've read more of the other uh, shortlisted books for that. So for the past and future readathon, it fit the prompt uh, read a book set in the future. So the entire book is not set in the future, but the story begins in 2038 and we meet Jake, who is a botanist and a forest guide for the pilgrims um, and basically celebrities who have come to see um, basically some of the last of the trees in existence. So because of the withering, this is an environmental disaster that has taken place. Um, and I've mentioned the structure of this book every time I talk about it because um, I just think it's genius. Uh, we follow the Greenwood family tree and um, it goes back in time following the rings of the tree. So we go back to 2008 where we meet Jake's father, Liam Greenwood. Um, then we meet Liam's mother, Willow, in 1974. In 1934, we meet my favorite character. Sorry about that weird noise. Um, my favorite character is Everett Greenwood. Um, then we go back to 1908, where we learn how this tree took root with two boys, Everett and Harris, and how their connection to trees happened early on. So once we have an understanding of the beginning of the family uh, and of the tree, um, we move forward again to 2038, filling in the gaps of the story. So it doesn't take long, you know, to get into this book, um, but there were some um, characters and their stories that I enjoyed more than others. Um, Everett and Harris, I think, are the best written stories, uh, but of course, you know, everyone is all connected and um, it's important to see how they all fit. So it might seem obvious, but <laughs> the themes are about climate change and the environment, um, I would say as well as like the gap between the rich and poor. So this is a book that you don't just read, you, you experience this book. Um, this is a good book if you like stories about families, uh, multi-generational stories, um, or if you're curious about the structure and the writing, 
Um, if you like themes about the environment, um, then I highly recommend this. I do apologize about this sound if you can hear it, but I'm just going to carry on. Um, so next I changed it up a bit. This is from a series and it begins, Anthony Bridgerton had always known he would die young. And this is from The Viscount Who Loved Me by Julia Quinn, uh, the second book in the Bridgerton series. So each one of these books focuses on a different person or different couple. So in this case, it is about Anthony Bridgerton and Edwina Sheffield. Or is it Kate Sheffield? You have to read it to find out. Uh, so this is a bit of an enemies to lovers trope and a forbidden romance. Uh, there are some very clever lines, witty banter, and I did laugh out loud a time or two. Um, I've been reading these after watching the show because um, I think I think I've mentioned this before that the show for me is just pure entertainment and in some ways I think they're better than the books. Um, I have been enjoying both but I think I enjoy the books more after I've watched the series. So I think I will stick with doing that as we go ahead with the series. So this is for anyone who is a fan of the Bridgertons, uh, the, the family and or the Netflix series. Um, if you like Regency romances and maybe romances in general, um, then this is worth picking up. Next up I have a memoir that begins. I was born and raised on the most beautiful location on the face of the earth, northern Manitoba, where it meets Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, and what since 1999 has been called Nunavut. And this is from Permanent Astonishment by Thompson Highway. I loved this book from the first chapter. Um, even the author's notes, which are important uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, who Thompson Highway is, in my opinion, he is one of the most underrated Canadian icons. Uh, Thompson is two-spirit, uh, born the 11th of 12 children in Brochet in northern Manitoba, uh, as he describes in the first line, and Thompson is a residential school survivor and an incredibly talented musician and writer. Um, I couldn't wait to read this memoir to learn more about Thompson and his story and I'm so glad that I read it because, um, wow, what a storyteller. So the story begins before Thompson's birth and I was captivated. The writing and sense of place is exceptional. The descriptions of the North, uh, the lifestyle, the difficulties and the love for the land are told with so much love and passion and the same is true with relationships so the love that Thompson has for his parents um, his siblings uh, especially his brother Renee who he was very close to are um, they're very apparent so if you've wondered you know what people talk about when they talk about um, life before colonialism uh, especially in the north uh, this might give you some sense of that idea. Um, of course, things didn't stay that way for Thompson and his siblings and his family. Um, they attended residential schools. And Thompson doesn't dwell on that too long, but uh, is quite honest about things that, that happened there. Um, the story ends when Thompson is still a teenager. So I'm really hoping that there are plans to write more about his life because um, I, I'm hoping to learn more about that part and I was also hoping to learn more about his brother Renee who was also in the arts and is a really interesting character himself. So in this story there is love of the land, um, the importance of language. Thompson has a real love for language and has uh, written about being multilingual and the importance that that has had in his life. Um, there's definitely some Canadian history if you are interested in that. And I just love how this was written in the fashion of storytelling. So this is a good book for anyone who um, enjoys memoirs, wants to learn a bit of you know Canadian history and living life in the North. And if you are curious about Thompson Highway um, and his family, this was my fourth five-star read of the year. And I'm so glad that I read it. 
Um, and I now have a couple more Thompson Highway books on my shelves that I will need to get to hopefully pretty soon. The next book was my fifth five star read of the year and it begins wailing. This is from Life's Too Short by Abby Jimenez. This is the, or Jimenez I guess it is. Um, this is the third book in the Friend Zone series. Um, so if you've been watching my channel for a while then you know I don't always get along with series uh, really. Plus I tend to really get bored with them. Um, but with this series I gave the first one four stars, the second one five stars. And I also awarded the second one um, Best Romance in 2022. And here's the thing. I like this one better than those two put together. Um, you could actually read this as a standalone, um, but there are uh, some linked characters, but it took a long while for them to appear in the story. Um, and if you don't know who they are, you know, you aren't, you aren't missing anything uh, for the storyline. Uh, however, if you have read the previous books, um, when the characters are linked, it's like, for me, it was like seeing friends that you haven't seen, you know, in a long time. So I was like, oh, there you are. <laughs> so um, this is the story about Vanessa and Adrian, who are neighbors in an apartment building. And she's a YouTuber. He's a lawyer. Um, she likes to try new things and live life to the fullest and Adrian works and works and doesn't really take time off. So this is a friends to lover story and it made me laugh out loud within the first few paragraphs. Um, I quickly fell into this story and just enjoyed it every step of the way. So this is good for anyone who um, enjoys a friends to lovers trope, has enjoyed the previous books in this series for sure, um, and wants a feel-good rom-com with fun characters. We are going from fun five stars to serious five stars now. Um, this book begins, there's no way to know the exact second your life changes forever. And this is from the memoir The Sun Does Shine by Anthony Ray Hinton. Um, I heard about this book from Nikki from Red Dot Reads and was really glad when I was able to pick it up for like four bucks. Um, and you may know this story by the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Um, I'm hoping to read that book soon as well. Um, it's been on my radar a lot longer than this one. Um, but Just Mercy um, has also been made into a film which I have seen so I did know this story. Um, the Sun Does Shine is the true story how Anthony Ray Hinton spent 30 years on death row for a crime that he didn't commit. Um, I find books and stories like this fascinating to learn how people survive, how they find hope and purpose in really difficult situations. Um, Anthony Ray Hinton was just 29 when he was arrested for murder. Um, because of his innocence, he, he just assumed that it would be obvious to anyone who was paying attention that he was innocent. But unfortunately, things did not go that way. And he talks about his faith, how he realized that he could make a difference, um, even behind bars. He actually started a book club, which I thought was <laughs> really great. Um, and one of the parts that I find most inspiring is his friendship with Lester. So Lester is uh, the author's best friend from childhood and Lester visited every week for 30 years. And that kind of friendship, especially under these difficult circumstances, is so hard to find. So we don't have the death penalty in Canada. So I always find stories like this um, even more interesting when it shows you know, how people are treated um, based on income and race. Um, it's just amazing to me how Anthony Ray Hinton managed to not lose himself under these circumstances, um, but kept his hope and humor. He's a funny guy. Um, so this didn't necessarily have the best writing, but I did give it five stars uh, because of the story. And it's a book that I have continued to think about often. So this is a good book if you like true stories, uh, prison stories, and books about 
uh, the strength of the human spirit. Another five star read that I have from January was the book that had been on my TBR the longest and it begins when I was little, the great mystery to me wasn't how babies were born, but why. And this is from My Sister's Keeper by Jodi Picoult. Um, this book has sat on my shelf forever, and I am so glad that I finally read it. Um, I also used it for the TBR vet for the past and future readathon. Um, I had known the premise of this book and saw the movie when it came out. Um, and I knew that there was, I'm going to say controversy about the ending, um, but it had been so long since I've seen this movie uh, that I actually couldn't have told you, you know, too much about it. And I didn't remember the ending at all. Um, the ending in the book, though, I don't think that I will be able to forget it anytime soon. I loved this book. Um, this is the story of a family with a sick child. Kate has leukemia and at one point the chances of her finding a bone marrow match are so small and her parents make the decision to have another child using a pre-implant implantation genetic diagnosis so that this child um, can be a match for Kate and they have Anna and Anna's life revolves around Kate's hospital stays and illness and she is poked and prodded, you know, just as much, uh, if not more, maybe as her sister, even though she's not sick. And eventually Anna seeks out a lawyer to get medical emancipation um, so that she can make her own decisions. So the story, I think, is brilliantly told from alternating uh, perspectives of the family members, uh, the mother, the father, the brother and Anna. So there's also the perspective of Campbell, who is the lawyer that Anna finds. And I really enjoyed his character very much uh, and his dog. So the tensions in this book are so well written. Uh, the tension between the parents, uh, the ethical tensions that exist, um, the parents and the siblings and how each sibling experiences something different uh, throughout all of this. It all felt very real. The characters felt real and the story felt real. So I went from like feeling empathy and compassion to feeling anger and frustration. Um, the story makes you think and I love that in a book. Um, plus the ending. There's a lot to explore in this one for sure. So this is good for anyone who likes stories told from uh, several perspectives, stories about family, and stories that just make you think about some heavier subjects. I highly recommend this one. This next one is kind of a five star read too. Um, I will explain. Uh, so this begins, everyone who knew Benjamin Ovich, particularly those of us who knew him well enough to call him Benji, probably knew deep down that he was never the sort of person who would get a happy ending. This is from the last book in the Beartown series, The Winners, uh, by Frederick Backman. This is translated from the Swedish by Neil Smith. I absolutely love this series. I love the characters. I love the intensity of this story and this small town. Um, this was my most anticipated books of last year. And I used it for a book you're looking forward to for the past and future readathon. So why is it sort of a five star read? Well, on its own, I probably wouldn't have given it five stars. Um, but because it is part of this series that I love, um, and I have given the other two books five stars, um, I am giving this five stars as well. Um, I don't want to say too much about the story since you really do need to read the first two books to kind of um, understand the complexity of this small town. Um, Backman does a really good job in this of letting you know enough background to kind of jog your memory without retelling the entire story. So I really appreciated that. Um, Benji, who is the character mentioned in the opening line, is my favorite character in the series and he continues to have a special place in my heart. Um, but I have to be honest and say that this was my least favorite of the three books. 
Um, the second book, Us Against You, was my absolute favorite. It had all the emotions, all the feelings, with great writing, and also characters and the story. Um, the first book, Bear Town, is my second favorite, and um, I have so much respect for Backman's writing in this because he covers so much and really made me feel for the characters and he set up the story perfectly so that you would understand this town and the people that live in it and I felt like I knew this world and had actually you know visited this this world so this book I enjoyed because it continues that world with you know some of the some of the characters there are new characters introduced as well um, but the storyline didn't grab me in the same way and you are plopped back into the world for only two weeks and um, I was happy to revisit these characters but for a book that is the size of the first like this is huge for the first two books put together um, I guess I was just hoping for a bit more so it's a bit of a letdown but I'm good knowing um, where everyone ended up and this still remains one of my favorite series of all time. Um, so this is good if you are already a fan of the Bear Town series and um, you know you want to see how it all ends and where the characters end up going. Um, so yeah. The next book on my pile is my lowest rated book um, and I know that's probably an unpopular opinion. It's three stars, still not bad. Um, it begins at half past six on the 21st of June, 1922, when Count Alexander Ilyich Rostov was escorted through the gates of the Kremlin onto Red Square. It was glorious and cool. So this is from A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Towels. Um, I have been anxiously awaiting reading some Amor Towels and I do want to try his other books. So this hasn't put me off in any way. Um, this one was just okay for me, but I thought that this was going to be a five-star read because so many people rave about this book. So basically the story takes place in 1922, or begins in 1922, when Count Alexander Rostov is sentenced to house arrest in a hotel uh, near the Kremlin. Now, I have been to Russia, so from the opening scene and the times that, you know, places are mentioned, I could imagine where it was taking place. So that was kind of neat. Um, but I think I was expecting more Russia. Um, and it is there in some of the food descriptions and things like that, uh, but just not in the way that I was hoping. Um, I was also hoping to have some feelings for this main character who is um, basically the one driving the whole story. So there was empathy for him since you know he was in isolation in a hotel for writing a poem um it was interesting to see how he found purpose in his life uh, under these circumstances and i really liked his relationship with the little girl that i can't think of her name right now um i think that was probably my favorite part was that relationship uh that and the ending i think that was well done as well um but this is a book that I might forget, you know, and it didn't impact me the way that I was thinking it would. So that being said, I'm glad I read it. And this is good for um, anyone who likes kind of closed room stories, uh, character driven stories, and stories set in Russia. This next book I'm not going to be talking about too much. Um, but I did read it in January and I used it for the past and future readathon prompt a book from before yeah before you were born so this is a few years before i was born and the book begins here is the house and this is from the bluest eye by tony morrison which i will be talking about uh, next week i think it is i'll be talking about a lot more in depth for the reading project that i'm doing with aj from aj dunn reads and writes called tuesdays with tony um, we will both be putting up videos on our thoughts about this book um, on Tuesday, so stay tuned for that um, to get all of that info. The next book is another one that I have said I am going to read for the past several years now, and I have always said that I wanted to read it in winter. Um, and it begins, 
Mabel had known there would be silence. This is from The Snow Child by Eowyn Ivy. Um, I'm going to be talking more about this one as well in a week or two. We'll see um, when I do a pairing video. Um, but for now, I will say that this is a lovely, whimsical, magical story. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Odd Life of Timothy Green, it has those kind of vibes, um, except with a winter atmosphere that is incredible. Um, it is based on a Russian fairy tale and it takes place in Alaska in the 1920s. Uh, Jack and Mabel want a child and in their grief and sadness they build a snow child. And then the next day the snow child is gone and there is a young girl in the woods. Her name is Faina, I think it's how you say it, um, and there is something about her that is otherworldly. Uh, so as Jack and Mabel get to know her, they begin to think of her as their daughter. And this is, this is just really a beautiful story. And for a debut, I thought it was stunning. Uh, the only thing that stopped me from giving this a five star uh, rating was the ending. I, I don't know if I just didn't get it or what, but I was kind of let down a bit by it. Um, but this is still a really good book and I would highly recommend it. Um, I will be sharing more of my thoughts uh, about it, as I said, in a pairing video uh, later on this month. So I have also put her second book on my TBR. Um, I'm really looking forward to more of Eowyn Ivy's writing. So this is a good book to pick up if you like magical stories, if you like fairy tales, and books set in winter. This next book I read for the Reading Across Canada Challenge as well, and it begins from a very young age, I went to galleries, art shows, dance performances, and music festivals. So this is from the introduction of Bloom Where You Are Planted by Becca Shane Denter. The introduction itself is very well written and explains why the author chose this particular project. So this is a compilation of 49 women and one non-binary person from British Columbia. And they are all artists and entrepreneurs. Um, and each of the 50 people have basically four pages dedicated to them. So first with their picture and then three pages of an interview. And the questions in the interview start with their childhood and how creativity was introduced into their lives. Um, they talk about what or who inspires them and how the pandemic has impacted their work um, and how they see their work impacting the world. So this was just a really interesting way to learn about uh, different people and um, the only thing that I wish it had more of was more pictures. Uh, sometimes the stories refer to a piece of art or you know something that they're working on and I thought Oh, I'd like to see that. So I do wish that there were um, more pictures. But other than that, um, this was a, a good book. Um, it could be used as a coffee table book, I think. This is good for anyone interested in creativity, uh, learning about creative people. And as I said, if you are looking for a really good coffee table book, then here's a really good Canadian coffee table book for you. The final book I read in February begins. We Have Your Daughter, and this is from The School of Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. Oh, this book. This is one of those books that I wish my book club would have read because I really want to chat about this book, um, especially with mothers. So if you are a mother and you've read this, please let me know your thoughts. Um, on this story. This is another debut and the idea of this book is so good. Um, I don't think this ever says where it takes place. Does it take, um, but if I had to, okay, so I'm just gonna guess, I'm guessing I'm going to say futuristic USA. Um, the government has programs for mothers who don't take good care of their children, according to them. Um, the main character in this story is Frida she neglected and abandoned her daughter uh, Harriet. She left for a couple of hours on a very bad day 
and Harriet, um, not Harriet, uh, yeah, Harriet is sent to live with her um, father and his girlfriend, and Frida goes into the school for good mothers, where the women learn how to be a good mother using dolls that are programmed. And the programming is about, you know, how long to hug your child and how to teach your child certain things. And um, the women are watched constantly. So this does have kind of a Handmaid's Tale vibe to it. And the issues that are raised in this book are very relevant. Um, I think every mother I know has thought at some point or other that they were a bad mom because of whatever reasons, whether they made sense or not. So I think this plays into that vulnerability. And of course, there is no school for good fathers. So there's also the idea of um, immigrant parents and having different cultural approaches to parenting that aren't really understood. There's just so much going on here. There's a lot to talk about. Um, the only reason I didn't give this five uh, stars is because the training went on and on and on and on and I didn't feel that there was really strong character development within that with with Frida um, I think that there could have been you know more plot maybe um, but the ideas in this story that it's trying to get across is done well and as I said this one will definitely make you think so these are the 14 books that I read in January. It was a really strong reading month. Um, I don't think that I've ever had so many five star reads in one month before. Uh, so please let me know, you know, your thoughts if you've read any of these or if you are interested in picking any of them up. Um, did you have any five star reads in January? I'd love to hear about that as well. I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget to make every day an adventure.